Anyone who has ever followed the ministry of Herbert W. Armstrong over the course of his long and fruitful life has probably wondered, where is God working today? You can know the answer to that question if, as Jesus said, you will judge by the fruits. The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Trumpet Daily. Over the past year and a half, the largest offshoot of Herbert W. Armstrong's Worldwide Church of God, ironically named the United Church of God, has been rocked by internal division and contentious strife, much of it brought on by disgruntled ministers who are unhappy with the way the church is governed. It is also ironic that the church appears to have fallen apart after the same manner it first broke away from the Worldwide Church of God in 1995, following a series of secret meetings and mass resignations. The United's first ministerial conference in May 1995 attracted 150 former elders of the Worldwide Church of God, a veritable who's who of the Worldwide Church of God hierarchy. Former members of the WCG, fed up with what the Tkachas had done to the church, fled for the United in droves. Within weeks of its coordinated kickoff, the United Church of God became the largest splinter group to ever break away from the Worldwide Church of God. Approximately 6,000 members attended its first Sabbath service in 1995. By the end of 1996, its worldwide membership had swelled to about 20,000 people. Within seven years of its inception, the church had more than 200 congregations worldwide and well over 300 elders. From the outset, United Ministers made no secret of their intent to try out a new approach to government, a bottom-up format where the General Assembly of Ministers would regularly vote for a council of elders. The Interim Council, set up in 1995, chose David Hume, a well-known WCG evangelist and presenter on the World Tomorrow television program, to serve as the church's first president. After his appointment, Hume made these candid remarks about the UCG's new government format. He said, it's not a hierarchical structure anymore. It's a collaborative process, and it should be seen as that. He admitted this was a radically different approach to what Mr. Armstrong used, but was convinced that God's hand was behind the establishment of the UCG. The brethren, he said, just needed to give the new government a chance. Give it time, he said. As it turns out, Mr. Hume gave it less than three years after a contentious and protracted struggle with the Council of Elders he was removed from office in early 1998 and left the church soon after. I could no longer support a governance structure that I believe has failed, Hume wrote to those who followed him out of the United Church. I have had to admit that Herbert W. Armstrong was right in Mystery of the Ages, especially chapter 6, where he describes a proven form of government for the church. Now that is an incredible statement. It took 20 years of service as a minister in the Worldwide Church of God and three years as president of the United Church of God for him to finally conclude that Mr. Armstrong was right. But instead of searching for a worldwide work that was backed by God's family government, he opted to start yet another church, an offshoot of the offshoot, so to speak. Rod Meredith is another prominent WCG evangelist who got burned by the collaborative scheme. When he broke free from the Worldwide Church in 1993 to form the Global Church of God, he claimed to be following in the footsteps of Mr. Armstrong. Yet the very first doctrine he changed was the principle of God's family government that Mr. Armstrong used throughout his ministry. 
If we look into the New Testament with an open mind, we find a totally different approach to government than what has developed in the church, Mr. Meredith wrote in Church Government and Church Unity. The right kind of government, he later wrote in his 1993 booklet, should be collegial in form. It should include a broad representation of all the elders in the church. This is what he believed in 1993. Five years after he wrote that, after the church's board of directors terminated his employment at the Global Church of God, he then changed his tune on the subject of church governance. It took him 40 years of service as an evangelist in the Worldwide Church of God and five years as president of Global to figure out that Mr. Armstrong got it right on the principal formation of God's government in the church. Given these much publicized, embarrassing failures, you would think these men would wonder, where was God during the three years I served as president of United? Or where was God when I founded Global? Prior to the first United Conference in 1995, Mr. Hume said he was skeptical that a large group of ministers could ever reach a consensus on church governance. After he came out on top, however, he was convinced that God's hand was behind it. Mr. Meredith was equally sure that God was behind his collegial experiment back in 1993. He claimed to be faithfully preaching everything Mr. Armstrong taught. Today, both Meredith and Hume head up two spin-offs of WCG offshoots. All totaled, there must be at least 100 offshoots of what was once the Worldwide Church of God. It makes you wonder, how many failed experiments with collaborative government will it take for former members of the Worldwide Church of God to wake up and figure out where God is working today? Since firing David Hume in 1998, the United Church of God has tried out four other presidents. In 2009, amid swirling controversies about the proposal to move the home office, uh, about complaints of politicized block voting within the General Conference of Elders, and about charges of unethical behavior and financial mismanagement aimed at board members, the church's president decided to give up his chair on the council, but to continue on serving as president. Against this backdrop, the council distributed an eight-page heart-to-heart letter to all the elders in the church. In it, board members maintained that God was still leading United, but that the UCG ministry had become deeply divided and the atmosphere in the church had become toxic. The council wrote, Due to this negative spiritual incursion into our fellowship, for more than two years we have been forced to focus our church's time, energy, and resources inwardly. Later, board members expressed grave concern about the preservation of the United Church of God. Now, since that time, the church has split apart into many competing groups. We predicted this would happen way back at the start, when the former worldwide ministers gathered themselves together to experiment with a new government format. On May 6th, for example, back in 1995, my father said this about the newly established United Church. He said, it absolutely will fail because it's a new form of government and not the one that Herbert Armstrong taught us, inspired by God. He issued the very same warning about Mr. Meredith's collegial experiment in 1993. He wrote, you can't do God's work without God's government. Mr. Meredith will have that proved to him by God since he has shamefully failed to learn that most important lesson of all while he sat at the feet of Mr. Armstrong. Now by this point, you would think these men would have learned their lesson, but instead many of them just keep making the same mistakes, and so history keeps repeating itself. Meanwhile, the one organization that actually started the right way as a tiny mustard seed planted in 1989 without any of the best known former ministers of the Worldwide Church of God or their many thousands of supporters, but with God's family government, continues to grow and prosper as it fulfills its God-given commission 
to prophesy again before all the world and to raise up the ruins of a work God established and built through his servant, Herbert W. Armstrong. Let's notice what it says in Amos chapter 9. This is the book of Amos. The prophet Amos wrote in chapter 9 and verse 11, he said, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. This work, as I just mentioned, our work, God's work we call it, began in 1989 with two unemployed, uh, relatively unknown ministers, uh, about $80 to work with in the church account. And that's it. A few addresses and, of course, our signature work at the start called Malachi's Message. And from there, over the past 21 years, it's grown to be what we see it as today. Verse 12, it says, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, says the Lord that does this. As we've explained in our literature, we feel like this is referring to much of the works that God inspired Mr. Armstrong to write over the course of his long ministry. And of course, our reprinting of those works began with the distribution of Mystery of the Ages back in early 1997. Soon after we printed that book, as I think most of our followers know, a grueling six-year copyright battle ensued in which we went head-to-head -head with the Worldwide Church of God leadership over its avowed Christian duty to bury the teachings of Herbert W. Armstrong. In the end, we not only won the rights to Mystery of the Ages, we obtained ownership to 18 other works of Mr. Armstrong, including The Incredible Human Potential, The United States and Britain in Prophecy, and the 58 Lesson Bible Correspondence Course. Let's notice Matthew 7 and verse 20. Actually, we'll back up to uh, verse 16 just to get the context here. It says, You shall know them by their fruits. This is Jesus speaking. Matthew 7 and verse 16, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? It says, Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. You can see it in nature. If it's a bad tree, it's not going to bring forth good fruit. Verse 18 says, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And then finally it concludes, Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. By their fruits. That's how God wants us to judge. That's how God wants us to evaluate uh, these works today so many of them claiming to be following in the footsteps of Mr. Armstrong. But as we strongly believe, there's only one that is doing that. There's only one that's raised up the ruins of that work that went before us and that maintains that proper family government that Mr. Armstrong used so beautifully, so wonderfully, so lovingly over the course of his 50-year ministry. The fruits of this little church, I mean, it, it did have that very, very small beginning back in 1989. But since then, I mean, the, the fruits that this work has produced have been abundant and visible. In the summer of 2000, for example, we purchased 160 acres here in northern Edmond, Oklahoma. And uh, we started Herbert W. Armstrong College the following year. As Mr. Armstrong learned early on in his ministry, the work of preaching the gospel to the world directly paralleled the growth of Ambassador College. It was the development of the college in Pasadena that made possible the growth of the whole gospel work, he wrote in his autobiography. With the college and the headquarters building program, now well into their 10th year,